You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Peace Explorer with your host, Dr. Gail Ash. Dr. Lash's company, Tourism for Peace, helps to encourage people to get to know one another and to honor the diversity of the human race and the sacredness of Mother Earth. So now, please welcome the host of Peace Explorer, Dr. Gail Lash. Hello and welcome to Peace Explorer. This is your host, Dr. Gail Lash, and you're listening on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be talking about how to achieve justice for women facing gender-based abuses and human rights of abuses and violence. And we'll be highlighting an organization that my guest has created and been working with many, many women all over the world for this, um, for justice. So before I bring on my guests, though, let's talk just a moment about Peace Explorer. And I'm encouraging you to go to Facebook and to join our Facebook group called Peace Explorer, because we have all the links for the show on that Facebook group. And you can find out more about all the different things we talk about there. And also, please share your stories as to how you are searching for peace, how you have had success and what you might uh, want to address in the future. We have actions and tools that you can use there on that Facebook group, as well as our website, tourismforpeace.com. And then also, I'd encourage you to hashtag opt for peace and create your own peace park or p place of peace, which is really an opportunity in your community to create some place outdoors where people can gather to have discussions about peace and what it looks like, how you can solve your various community issues, and people can get to know each other and have an opportunity to, to really start to change your community. So you can go to worldpeacetrails.com and find out more about that and get on our World Peace Trails map. <laughs> so today, as always, I introduce the show with a peace concept. And because we're talking about justice today, I thought it would be very appropriate to choose justice as the peace concept. These are actually a deck of cards and a, they come from a deck of cards and a family's and teacher's guide from the Virtues Project. And you can go to virtuesproject.com and find out more about that. So this is what the card on justice talks about. It says, practicing justice is being fair. It is solving problems so everyone wins. You don't prejudge. You see people as individuals. You don't accept it when someone acts like a bully, cheats, or lies. Being a champion for justice takes courage. Sometimes when you stand for justice, you stand alone. And then it says you are practicing justice when you treat everyone fairly, think for yourself and refuge to prejudge, avoid gossip and backbiting, own your mistakes and fix them, protect people's rights, including your own, solve problems so everyone wins. And then it has an affirmation and it says, I act with justice. I stand up for the rights of, my, of others and myself I have no need to pretend or defend. I choose to make amends. So I'll put this peace concept again on our Facebook group, Peace Explorer, so you can look at it when you choose. So today I have a guest who definitely embodies wholeheartedly this concept of justice. My guest is Laylee Miller Moreau, and she's CEO of the Tahare Justice Center. And the Tahare Justice Center is a national nonprofit organization that protects courageous immigrant women and girls refusing to be victims of violence. 
and pro by providing holistic legal services and advocacy in the courts, communities, and Congress. So let me read you a little bit about Laylee. Since 2001, she has led the Tahere Justice Center in its service to more than 25,000 women and girls seeking, seeking protection from gender-based human rights abuses, such as rape, female genital mutilation, domestic violence, human trafficking, honors crimes, and forced marriage. In recognition of its sound management and innovative programs, Tahereh won the Washington Post Award for Excellence in Nonprofit Management and received commendation for its innovative use of pro bono attorneys in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Prior to joining, joining Tahereh as executive director, Laylee was an attorney at the law firm of Arnold and Porter K. Scholler, where she practiced international litigation and maintained a substantial pro bono practice. Prior to joining Arnold and Porter K. Scholler, Laylee was an attorney advisor at the U.S. Department of Justice Board of Immigration Appeals. She received her JD and MA in International Relations from American University and her BA from Agnes Scott College. In 2012, Laylee Miller Moreau was named one of Newsweek's 150 Most Fearless Women in the World. Wow, I love that. <laughs> she has been featured as a lecturer and has appeared in numerous news outlets, including CNN, Fox News, The New York Times, NPR, PBS, and The Washington Post. She lives in Washington, D.C. area with her husband and three children. And you can find out more about Laylee and the Tahare Justice Center at tahare.org. That's T A H I R I H dot O R G. Welcome, Laylee, to Peace Explorer. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm happy to have you here. So let's talk for a moment about how you got involved in working with women and girls who are victims of violence. What set you on that track? Um, all my life, I had a deep interest in issues of civil rights and human rights issues. I grew up in Atlanta and was exposed there and became involved in issues of racism and um, race relations and had a passion for that. I worked for the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Social Change um, and then later to, for, to the Carter Center. And um, those experiences really directed me towards wanting a career in human rights or civil rights. But when I was in law school, I had an experience that defined that for me. And the experience was working with a young woman. She was 17 years old at the time, and she was fleeing a forced polygamous marriage, as well as a tribal ritual known as female genital mutilation or female genital cutting. And she came to the United States because this is the only other continent in which she had family. She fled because her father died suddenly and a man who had power to protect her from female genital mutilation no longer lived. His, his family, who inherited all of his assets, including his minor children, then forced her to leave school and arranged for her to be married to a 45-year-old man as his fourth wife. And as a condition of that union, they wanted her to undergo the mutilation that she avoided up until that point because of her father's protection. And female genital mutilation was a ritual in her community that defined womanhood. You weren't considered to be a woman unless you underwent the ritual. Women and girls uh, wouldn't talk to her. They would, she would enter a room where they were and they would fall silent when she entered because she wasn't considered to be a woman or one of them. Um, being accused of not being cut and not having been cleansed um, was the biggest insult you could hurl against another woman. People went to blows over insults like that. So the pressure was intense in order to conform. Her father was very, very unusual in saying no um, to the ritual. But when he died and her protection ended, her family arranged for her to conform in a way that she hadn't. They arranged for her to be mutilated. They arranged 
for her to undergo female genital mutilation and the forced marriage. And with the help of her sister, she escaped to the United States. And that's where I met her. Wow. Well, we're going to take a short break now and follow up with that story, that amazing story, in just a moment. Uh, this is your host, Dr. Gail Lash, and we're here with our guest, Laylee Miller Moreau. And you're listening to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Essential Nutrients LLC is the brainchild of entrepreneur Barbara Burns. Inspired by a desire to help others, Barbara worked with a team of scientists to develop unique nutritional liquid supplements with the goal to improve the quality of your life. Glucosamine, zinc, and calcium are essential to well-being, and this is the focus of Essential Nutrients LLC. Whether you're a professional athlete, weekend warrior, student, business owner, or homemaker, Essential Nutrients offers products for everyone, including the family pet. And they're easy to take, no pills. Health requires commitment, exercise, a good diet, proper supplementation, and action. So take action today and get your supply of Essential Liquid Nutrients by visiting www.essential-liquids.com. Don't put off your health any longer. Take Essential products today and start to measure the difference. Unleash the obstacles that bind you with certified professional coach Joanne Charette, a master practitioner in energy leadership. Joanne can help you break through personal and professional barriers and guide you to a higher level of empowerment and fulfillment. Passionate and dedicated, Joanne engages with her clients on a mutual journey. Her dynamic energy will motivate you to move forward as you partner on a venture to greater results. Isn't it time to make a breakthrough and commit to live the life you deserve? Invest in yourself and let Joanne Charette be the catalyst to the realization of your dreams by making them a reality based in quebec canada joanne is also a space coach using social media and skype to work with anyone anywhere around the world contact joanne charette today at 819-360-3266 or email her at actionrealization at live.ca 819-360-3266 now is your time Welcome back, everyone, to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is your host, Dr. Gail Lash, and we're here with my guest, Laylee Miller Moreau. You were talking, Laylee, about you met this young woman who came to the United States after fleeing um, forced marriage and female genital mutilation. Continue with that story. What happened when you met her here in the States? Well, what was happening at the same time that she was um, experiencing the death of her father and that she was being forced into a polygamous marriage with a 45-year-old man, although she was 17, as well as um, being forced to undergo female genital mutilation, well, all of that was happening. I was a second-year law student at American University in the in Washington, D.C., and as fate had it, I had spent some time in West Africa. I was there um, participating in a Baha'i community social and economic development project. And when I was there, I was exposed to the first time. And this is in the early 90s when female genital mutilation wasn't widely known to the ritual. And so when I came back to school, I was just interested in it. My, my undergrad major was anthropology. I was very fascinated with different um, rituals. And when I was in law school, I began to academically study whether or not uh, how female genital mutilation was treated under the law, um, both from a criminal context and as well from an immigration context. What was happening under the law at that time that Fauzia came to the United States was highly controversial. So the definition of a refugee or an asylum seeker, and the only difference, by the way, is a refugee is outside the country coming in, an asylum seeker is already here trying to stay. But the law that they're both utilizing is exactly the same. It's a definition of a refugee. And that definition was developed after World War II in the Geneva Conventions in response to the world's outrage Overhearing stories like Jews being machine gunned down as they tried to enter the Swiss border by Swiss army guards. And so the, the international community basically said, hey, that's 
awful, and we need to protect people who are fleeing for their lives. But we can't protect people who are fleeing for any reason. They have to prove under the law in an adversarial courtroom environment that they're fleeing something that really is persecution, not inconvenience, can't, you know, not things like people aren't nice to me or I can't get a job, but persecution, which has a very high legal bar. Then you right. have to prove that your persecution is because of uh, is inflicted by the government or by a force that the government cannot or will not control, then you have to prove that your persecution is because of one of five reasons, your race, your religion, your nationality, your political opinion, or your social group membership. Now, when you listen to that legal definition, you notice that gender isn't there. Gender isn't one of the reasons for your persecution. So something like female genital mutilation, which is not inflicted by the government, it is not because of your race. It's because you're a woman in a particular culture. Wasn't at that time seen as a legal basis for refugee status. So completely academic and hypothetically, I wrote a law journal article making the argument that we should change the law and that the um, somebody fleeing female gender relations should receive protection because of, of um, under the refugee definition. So I was working for a lawyer in my second year of law school who happened to be hired by Fauzia, the young woman fleeing from Togo's cousin, and he handed me her case. And so I ended up representing her. Wow. <laughs> and you evidently took her case to the highest immigration court in the nation. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Um, when the case came to me, I was working as a summer law clerk for a private immigration attorney. And when he handed me the case, her trial was set for 14 days away, which oh meant my. we had 10. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he wasn't. Well, anyway, he, he, he the file had one piece of paper in it. And it, and it all it said was her name, where she was being detained because she was incarcerated at the time, which is what we do to people arriving at our borders and honestly passing off their passports and saying they're seeking protection in the United States. She didn't try to sneak into the country. She was very honest at the border. But what that meant was she was placed in maximum security prison. Wow. So it had her location, and she was only 17. She committed no crime. Um, and what it meant was that we had four days to prepare for her trial because there's a 10-day submission requirement. But as fate had had it, the hypothetical fact pattern that I used in the Law Journal article I wrote arguing that you should be able to receive asylum because of female genital mutilation was identical to her actual fact pattern. So I was able then to quite literally cut and paste her name in the Law Journal article with some edits, and we were able to submit a lengthy brief on her behalf and about 100 pages of exhibits and materials that wouldn't have been reproducible in four days, but was possible <laughs> because of the research, you know, over the last year. Her case, I argued her case before the immigration judge. We lost. Um, then I took her case to the Human Rights Law Clinic at American University where I was a student and continued to represent her on appeal. And her case was appealed to the highest immigration appellate court. At that stage, there was a lot of media attention in the case. It was very controversial. People were worried that they, they kept saying, you know, if there would be a floodgates of women seeking protection um, because women are treated badly all over the world, which is true, of course. But the legal definition, the standard in this adversarial court system that we have makes it really hard to win asylum. Um, and in fact, we, that's that's proven true. It, not many. The numbers did not increase that much um, because of gender based asylum. Um, the media attention forced the courts to look seriously at her case. Um, they heard the case uh, and she won. And when she won, her case ended up changing the law and she set precedent 
with regard to gender-based asylum. And so now there's this body of law called gender-based asylum, which essentially means that you can receive protection because of persecution inflicted inflicted because of gender. Um, there were really two things that happened. The law changed, and we can talk more about the evolution of the law since her case. The other thing that happened was there was commercial interest in her story and my helping her as a law student, and there was some money available, and I created the Tahereh Justice Center with that. Wow. Well, we're going to take a short break, uh, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. So stay tuned to hear more from our guest, Leila Miller Moreau. And this is your host, Dr. Gail Lash. You're listening to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Leip is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Leip's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. Welcome back, everyone, to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is your host, Dr. Gail Lash, and we're here with my guest, Laylee Miller Moreau. Laylee, you were just saying from this unprecedented case or this this amazing case of making gender based violence uh, part of the asylum, you know, rounds for asylum, that you were able to receive funds to create the Tahereh Justice Center. Tell us more about that and why it may be called its name, Tahereh Justice Center. Sure. So there um, there were a few things that happened as a result of Fauzia's case, but um, one of them was the fact that it became clear to me that there was a huge need for an organization that would work to defend women and girls who are fleeing gender-based violence. Um, I was getting a lot of phone calls personally from girls and women who needed help. And then when there was commercial interest and Fauzia and I wrote a book together, I used all of my portion of the proceeds of the book um, to start the Tahereh Justice Center. Um, the Tahereh Justice Center, and, and in the very beginning, you know, I was only 23 when all of this happened, and I had wow. <laughs> fortunately some some wise mentors in my life who reminded me I didn't know what I was doing. And so I <laughs> stayed out of Tahereh's day-to-day running for the first five to six years and during that time, tried my best to, to try to learn how to be a lawyer. Having one good case or, you know, one precedent-setting case doesn't make you a good lawyer. It makes you a lucky lawyer. But um, I worked at a large law firm for a period of time. I worked at the Justice Department for a period of time. But Tahare as an organization, was growing. We were hiring staff. And I ended up joining. Um, now it's been um, about 16 years that I've been here full-time. 
And since then, we've grown quite a bit. Uh, we have almost 90 full-time staff. We are in San Francisco, um, Atlanta, Houston, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. And what we do is we provide free legal defense to women and girls who are fleeing a wide range of human rights abuses. It may be female genital mutilation. It may be human trafficking, domestic violence, child and forced marriage. You know, there's a long laundry list, unfortunately, of abuses that women and girls suffer, and we see all of those. We provide immigration law um, defense. We provide family law defense, and we engage in some civil litigation. We do it in a holistic way, which means that we have social workers on staff who also assist in the cases so women can rebuild their lives and live safely while their case is pending. We also engage in public policy advocacy. We see trends, you know, we're litigating about um, 800 cases at any given moment in time. And oh that volume <laughs> allows us to see trends. And those trends translate into public policy recommendations so that women are more systematically protected. So that's, that's what the Tahereh Justice Center does now. Wow. Uh, it, is, it is saddened to hear and yet uplifting to hear that you're working on, <clears throat> on so many cases at once. It just proves how what a need there is for a center like yours. And I'm glad that you have offices in five different locations in the United States. Um, mm-hmm. what, what is being done now or what is kind of high on the list? You were just mentioning about trends. What's high on the list of trends that are you're seeing and needs attention and how our listeners might be able to be made more aware and and help in some way? Mm-hmm. I think um, there are many issues that Tahereh is working on right now. And the organization is over 20 years old right now. And we have worked in different environments, you know, we've worked actually right now, it's about exactly equally (laughs) in Republican administrations in democratic administrations. um, And there are always problems and there are always issues and and laws that need to be uh, changed and, and things that need to be defended. There is something uniquely difficult about the time that we're living in right now. Um, And it's not a partisan issue, but it relates to a psychosis, I think, that the world is having, particularly in the United States, but also in Europe, um, also in Australia and other places, where we don't see our connectedness to other people. And we are becoming very, like, turfish and self-protective and wanting to protect and, and benefit or advantage me and my family and people who look like me, but but not having sympathy or empathy or even seeing how we're connected to each other with with people who don't look like the dominant power and who come from other places. And so um, this work is very hard right now. Uh, in fact, we're doing a lot of self-care. Our staff are regularly traumatized, racial epithets, um, difficulties in dealing with police officers or immigration officials who aren't even following the law. They're kind of going rogue and doing things based on their own personal beliefs rather than on even what the law says. It's a really, really difficult time. Um, There are one of the more concerning things that's happening in addition to just the need of, of many more people for legal defense is the fact that Fauzia's case, this case that set precedent and established the right for women to receive protection in the U.S. under our asylum law because of gender-based persecution is being threatened. So immigration law is um, a different animal than other kinds of law. And the reason for that is that all immigration adjudication decisions are under the executive branch. You know, when we, when we grow up, we, we hear about three branches of government, right? The judiciary, um, the legislature, and the executive. And so one would think that judicial decisions or legal precedent is made under that independent judicial branch. 
but all of immigration legal decisions are in fact, and all the adjudicative bodies are in fact under the executive. So with one pen stroke, they can undo 20 years of legal precedent, and they're threatening to do that now with gender-based asylum. Well, we're going to take a short break, and we'll follow up with you, Laylee, when we come back on that uh, with our guest, Laylee miller Moreau of the Tahereh Justice Center. This is your host, Dr. Gail Lash. You're listening to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Abuse happens every moment of every day. According to national statistics in the United States, every two minutes, someone is sexually assaulted. And every 10 minutes, a report of child abuse is made. Those currently struggling with abuse, or if you know someone who has been the victim of abuse, you are not alone. Whether physical, mental, emotional, or sexual, no, there is hope. There is help. There is healing. Author Tammy Hall has written a book from her own account of abuse called Journey of Courage that can guide you through your own personal journey of healing. Stop struggling through life. It's your story. It's your healing. And it can begin with the first turn of the page. Visit www.journeyofcourage.com to begin your path to becoming the person you were ultimately created to be. Healed. Hopeful. Happy. Horses. Mystical. Present. Past. And future. All in one. Wild. Free. Domestic and healing for everyone. Betty Hames knows this and has put her horses to good use with Nature Connect Equine Coaching. Her mission is to help people affected by the loss of hope and trust in their lives and to rediscover the wonders of nature through nature-connected learning so they can rebuild their lives and live peacefully with newfound hope, trust, and joy. Betty Hames is also a certified elite life coach, a Washington State certified counselor, and chemical dependency professional. She is passionate about partnering nature with healing, and through horses, she sees amazing results and transformation in lives that might have otherwise been lost. Call 509-830-9225 and visit her at HamesLifeCoaching.com. Hold your horses. You're in for the ride of your life. Welcome back, everyone, to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is your host, Dr. Gail Lash, and I'm here with my guest, Laylee miller Moreau. Laylee, just before the break, you were talking about that the executive branch of government has the ability to change immigration law um, and with a pen stroke. And you were saying that before to achieve asylum, one had to meet of these six criteria now, I guess, of gender-based persecution, uh, whether you're fleeing for your race, your faith, and and others. Why would this now change after 20 years? It seems like there's great precedence for gender-based persecution. Why is there concern now that that will be eliminated? So um, earlier this month, or actually it was in March, um, the Attorney General took on what's called certification a case called Matter of AB. Um, initials are used to protect the victim. Um, that case deals with whether or not a woman can receive asylum because of uh, domestic violence. The woman in that case was from Central America. She had faced very, very extreme domestic violence. She tried to avail herself of police protection. She fled throughout the country. Her life was in danger. And her own government um, neither had laws, policies, nor the infrastructure to protect her. And so to protect her life, she fled to the United States. It is well settled under the law that, again, if you can meet these really high standards of evidence, really high standards of proving the nature of the harm, that it's persecution, that you had nowhere to go, and that your life was in danger, that you are eligible for asylum. He has now taken that case with the intention to overturn it and to change legal precedent. So he hasn't done it yet, but it's clear what the intention is, and he has done that first um, step, which is to certify the case to himself. Um, And so we actually, we have a change.org petition, and I would, there are over 70,000 signatures already on it. I would encourage anyone who's interested in advocacy in order to protect women and girls who are fleeing gender-based violence 
to sign the petition, to spread it on their social media. Um, if you go to change.org and you look up the Tahereh Justice Center or Domestic Violence Asylum, there are a whole bunch of things that you could plug in to find the petition. You can also find it off of our website, which is www.tahireh. Dot org, um, but we we need very intense advocacy and awareness raising right now, in order to um, protect women and girls who are fleeing gender based asylum. Amazing. So what? So you're obviously calling on that right now. What are the time frame mm -hmm. before this maybe actually happens? Signed into law or change the law? Yeah. It it could happen any day. We don't know. Um, it's sitting with the attorney general right now. And so any action people are able to take in order to oppose this um, would be helpful right now. And we're doing a lot now. of lobbying. Yeah. Yeah. It's right now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So change.org. Uh, we will mm -hmm. definitely go check that out. And so what would this mean? It would mean, obviously, that this woman would not receive asylum and and might mm -hmm. die, go back and, and be killed. Mm -hmm. But what else could it mean for people here in the United States? Um, well, it would also mean that other women like her who are trying to receive protection because of persecution being inflicted because of their gender would be unable to receive it. So the, the law would essentially change um, the precedent that is set would change in, in a very harmful way. And, and that would affect thousands and thousands of women. It sounds like it would go back to where you were in the 1990s. And mm -hmm. when uh, Fazia came in from Togo, you would be right back to where you started. That's exactly Correct? right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. And we would be oh. alone in that, by the way. Um, the international law that defines a refugee has been adopted and has been evolved in really all Western countries. And all of them recognize gender-based asylum. And so if the United States went backwards on this, that would be in contradiction to every other country. I mean, Canada, the United Kingdom, Germany, Australia, everyone recognizes gender-based asylum, and it would be very embarrassing, unfortunate, and also um, kind of backwards to the law if we, if we did this. So you're saying that the other countries have, have come so far as well, and we, uh, we would be reneging mm -hmm. on what we had agreed as a world community, basically, that is, is basis for asylum, gender-based persecution. Yeah, there is a common global understanding. And I, and I would say also that the United States was the last to the table. So when I litigated um, this case uh, of Fazia Kasinja that established legal precedent, opening the doors to gender-based asylum, Canada, the United Kingdom, France, other countries had already recognized gender-based asylum. So we were late in our recognition. And then we would be very... Um, um, unusual in going backwards. Mm -hmm. So again, I remind everyone to go to change.org and look up domestic uh, violence or persecution and also go to tahereh.org, T-A-H-I-R-I-H.org to find that petition to sign. Um, so let's talk a little bit about women and why they are so persecuted. I know that's a huge topic. We could talk for hours on that. But also, what else is going on that you have kind of the pulse on that we need to be aware of um, besides this change in, in uh, grounds for asylum for women? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, the treatment of women and girls, the violence that is inflicted on them is – a global phenomenon that's not unique to any culture, that's not unique to any religion, any class, any educational group. It's something that women face really uniformly, and it's only a symptom. It's a symptom of a larger problem, which is the overall inequality of women and men. 
And there's an analogy from my religious tradition, which I think helps to make this point. It's from the Baha'i Faith. And the Baha'i Faith talks about humanity being like a bird with two wings. One is the male and the one is the female. And until both of those wings are equally strong, the bird of civilization or society will remain handicapped and unable to fly to its fullest potential. And what I like about that analogy is that, you know, men and women are not in opposition. In fact, our equality, our coordination with each other is we're, is, is dependent, we're dependent on each other. We're both attached to the same bird. So our wings aren't independent of each other. They're both necessary for this flight for us to succeed and evolve. Also, what I like about the analogy is that, you know, the right wing of a bird is not actually interchangeable with the left wing. You can't stick the left wing of a bird on its right side and have it <laughs> work. True. They're They're different. They're different. They're unique and they are complementary. And so, you know, through this analogy, I think we can see how women and men are in this together. It's not a women versus men. It's a how can we both be strong? How can we both be equally coordinated and enable this bird of civilization to soar and reach its fullest potential? That's a beautiful analogy. And we're going to take a short break now. So please stay tuned to hear from my, my guest, Laylee Miller Moreau. And this is your host, Dr. Gail Lash. You're listening to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Are you stressed? Is your stress driving you crazy? Do you know there are many ways to relieve the stress? The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic does just that. Reduce your stress plus so much more. Established in 1997, the Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic offers an approach to wellness for those individuals who choose to either utilize appropriate complementary methods to enhance their current medical care or to those individuals who are on their personal journey toward improved health and wellness through the use of therapeutic bodywork, Reiki energy healing, or hypnosis. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic is owned by Dr. Judy Dean, a registered nurse and board-certified massage therapist and medical hypnotherapist in LaPorte, Indiana. Visit www.spiritwithinmassage-hypnosis.com to see all services offered by Dr. Judy. For a free personal consultation, please call Dr. Judy Dean at 219-326-1380. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic, 219-326-1380. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the Word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from Friends International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866-244-5679 and feel the glory. Welcome back to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is your host, Dr. Gail Lash, and we're here with my guest, Laylee Miller Moreau of the Tahare Justice Center. And Tahare, you're just having that beautiful analogy of the male and female are the two wings of a bird, and so the that civilization to fly really needs to have the, that equality of men and women. Uh, how can that play out in our society? And I want to get into, I know we were talking a little bit about uh, child marriage. That would seem to be that a subject where you'd need to have that equality of men and women to obviously form a union together in marriage. What is happening with women in regard to marriage these days? Well, so child marriage is often seen as something people witness in National Geographic magazine or they hear about in other countries. But in fact, it is happening in very large numbers here in the United States. There was a study that the Tahare Justice Center did 
that um, conclusively showed over 3,000 forced marriage cases. And then when we began to look at the law, we were shocked to find that the laws in the United States were completely inadequate to protect children from forced marriage. At that time, in the 50 United States, there were uh, there was not one state that had a law where you could not get married under 18. Every single state allowed children to get married. Um, some of them had minimum age requirements. Some of them didn't even have any minimum age requirements. Where a state had a minimum age requirement in all of those states, that requirement was waivable with the consent of parents. And then many states had no floor. So it would say, you know, you can be younger than 18, but it didn't say how young. And so we began doing what's called a FOIA request. It's a Freedom of Information Act request that allows you to see government documentation. And we learned that in many states, actually in all of the states, Thousands and thousands of children were being married um, as young as 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, um, and they, in most cases, were marrying men that were three times, four times their age. And so this was happening all over um, the United States. Um, and so the Tahrir Justice Center began a campaign to protect children from forced and child marriages and raising awareness. Um, we One case really affected us. It was the case of a girl who was 14 years old, and her family had found a man that they thought was suitable for her. She had never even met this man. She did not want to get married to him. And they went to the clerk's desk or to the, the um, window in the clerk's uh, office in the court and simply signed that waiver saying, as parents, we give consent, and so our 14-year-old can marry. The girl was at the window, the clerk's window, crying and saying to the clerk, I do not want to get married. And the clerk is looking at this form and realizing nowhere does it ask for the child's consent. Nowhere does it have any provision that would allow this girl to not get or allow the clerk really to refuse to give the marriage certificate to the parents. And so, you know, our laws were developed around child and forced marriage in the like turn of the century in the early 1900s. They were often developed around a time frame that was very different than it is now and also where Romeo and Juliet scenarios were being considered. Um, but what's happening now is often in insular communities, and this might be ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities, conservative Christian communities, um, sometimes immigrant communities, um, where but it, the, the common denominator is that they are insular communities, often very worried about the chastity of their children, particularly daughters, um, and want them to marry somebody of their choosing and they are forcing these children into marriage. So we've been able to successfully get laws passed in Virginia, in Texas, in Kentucky, um, and several other places that are now beginning to turn the tide and slowly, state by state, change the legal regime so that children can be protected from forced marriages. So in other words, the laws that you've helped put into place are that they that children under 18 cannot marry? In other words, you have to be 18 or older? Or what What are the laws stating? As, yeah, as a general rule, that's true. There, there are some exceptions where the, the court, um, and then it, the difference is that now under these new laws, there would be somebody court appointed to meet with that child in private to make sure it's really what they want okay. to do. <clears throat> but but 18, it does vary by state by state. In some states, 18 is the absolute threshold. In other states, it's 16, but with these legal protections in place. 18 is the international legal standard for a child marriage. And in the United States, what's important about the age 18 is that it is our age where you can enter a domestic violence shelter. You can contract for yourself. You can get a, you can vote, you know, there are all kinds of things legally tied to 18. And the problem with someone who marries at 16, at 17, is that under the law, they're not an adult. 
And so if they find themselves in a domestic violence situation, no domestic violence shelter will take them because they're not an adult. Um, no attorney will represent them because they're not an adult. They can't contract for legal representation. So until that other regime changes and a, a somebody could be considered a legal adult and get them outside or get themselves out of a dangerous situation, 18 is the age that makes the most sense under our current American legal context. Mm, thank you. We're going to take a short break. We'll come back with our guest, Laylee miller Moreau. This is your host, Dr. Gail Lash. You're listening to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. MJ Domit is the owner of Expect to be Empowered, a company whose specialty is empowering people to live their best life by following their heart and accepting themselves unconditionally. After studying and making personal changes, MJ now focuses on giving others tools for self-empowerment. She provides individual and group workshops for people who are physically, emotionally, and spiritually blocked. Inspired by her work at Expect to be Empowered, MJ authored the book Waves of Blue Light, Heal the Heart and Free the Soul with accompanying empowerment cards. She is a Spirit Book of the Year Gold Medal Living Now Book Award winner. And her book is a number one Amazon bestseller in spirituality and was a 2012 gold medal winner recognized as the Living Now Spirit Book of the Year. An inspirational speaker, MJ will show you how you can repurpose every area of your life. Your life did not just happen to you. You chose it, which means you can change it. Visit www.expecttobeempowered.com or call 866-264-8024. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305 705 3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. Welcome back to Peace Explorer on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is your host, Dr. Gail Lash, and I'm here with my guest, Laylee miller Moreau. Laylee, thank you for explaining about the age 18 and becoming an adult and what that means. It, it's, it's amazing to hear you speak of the Tahereh Justice Center and how you're working with this gender-based uh, violence and helping legally women who are facing gender-based persecution, that everything's connected. You know, we forget that we are, really are connected. So thank you for bringing that up. And and there's so much work to be done. There is so much work to be done. So we're mm-hmm. creating toward the end of the show. What would you last like to say for our listeners? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I do think that we're living in very special times. And I think that that right now is an amazing moment, opportunity for us to be alert, to be engaged, to look outside of ourselves, you know, to to push comfort zones, to put us in situations that are uncomfortable, to hear stories that are painful, but that, that need to be absorbed. Because I think, unfortunately, in my work, I see a very divided world of people with disadvantage and people with advantage. And those with advantage are so comfortable on their side of the road, (laughs) that there is very little empathy, sympathy, understanding, or even interest in people who have disadvantage. Um, And we fail to recognize that we're all connected and we will all suffer if, if a whole side of the road is suffering. And so whether it's you know, women who are experiencing violence, immigrants, people of color, people with disabilities, people who don't have the same access to education. Um, I just I think it's an exciting time. And if there was ever a time, it is now for us to get outside of our normal bubbles and to embrace each other and help each other. Absolutely. 
Well, yes, you are absolutely correct. And I want to remind everyone to go to change.org to sign that petition on helping the de- um, keep in place the, the gender-based domestic violence asylum law that is right now being threatened uh, from the, the our government. And please also go check out Laylee at tahare.org. That's T-A-H-I-R-I-H dot O-R-G. Thank you, Laylee, for being on Peace Explorer today. Thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome. So today I want to go in to go talk about our peace action for the week. And this came about because, you know, we're talking about all these different things that we we have in our lives. Um, you may be set on a routine and where you're very comfortable and what's going on. And so we have all these things to do. And I do encourage you to be ad- an advocate for women, to be an advocate for a better society, a peaceful society. And so the peace action today is based on this. Even though we have lots of things to do, this is the the tweet that I created. So these are short and potent, these peace actions. It says, when lots of things need to get done, take them one at a time. Organize, dream, execute, manifest, then do next. So it's my invitation to you to take this peace action and actually practice it to get the things done one at a time. And let me read this again. When things, when lots of things need to get done, take them one at a time, organize, dream, execute, manifest, then do next. So as always, I'll put this peace action up on our pace, our Facebook group, Peace Explorer, so you can read it. Please share your stories of how you are actually getting things done. I know I just came back from a conference and I've got lots of notes and follow-ups to do from the conference. So I'll be going through that and doing that myself. As always, though, I encourage you to create your own places of peace, get on our World Peace Trails map, start to talk to your neighbors about peace, what is it, and how you can create it in your community. Thanks for tuning in to Peace Explorer today on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is your host, Dr. Gail Lash. See you next week. Many blessings. You've been listening to Peace Explorer with your host, Dr. Gail Lash. Listen each week and become closer to the global peace principles for both self and society on Dr. Gail Lash's Peace Explorer. been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.